song is perfect for today because uh, that's exactly what we're looking at. Um, so I'm entitled today, Fulfilling Purpose. What is a fulfilling purpose, and how do I fulfill my purpose? How do I find out what that is? What has God created me for and to be? And so we are looking at the narrative of God's creation. So that's what I want to talk to you about today, being created by God. The Bible tells us very clearly that you are created. This foundational statement comes in Genesis 1.27, and it's this. So God created man in his image, and in the image and likeness created he him, male and female, he created them. The Bible says that we did not just come about by accident. You are in on purpose. You have been created by an intentional God with an intelligent design for something. You're not some cosmic accident. You're not the outcome of billions of years of natural selection or of an evolutionary process. You were intelligently designed, designed by God. When God created the universe and everything that was in it, He finished His miracle week of creation by creating humanity. We are His special creation. Everything else that he made was just spoken into existence. And when he came to that part of creating humanity, he actually got down into the dirt and built something with his bare hands. The touch of the Almighty formed you together. The psalmist says, I was knit together by you in my mother's womb. And if that's not intimate enough, that the hands of the Creator were on your being. He breathed into us the breath of life. I don't know how many of you have had a experience with performing CPR on somebody, but I can assure you it is a very intimate experience because as you're breathing into them, no matter how perfect you are at positioning the head to open the airway, some of that breath gets into the stomach. And out of the stomach comes some of the stuff that's in it. And you're down there in that mix. I'm just telling you how it is. It is an intimate and personal relationship. And the creator of the universe breathed his breath of life into you. You are a cherished creation. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not just stuck here trying to wonder what the purpose is of things. But not only are we created by a loving God, we are created in His image. A part of that means that we are an eternal being. We have an eternal soul, and we will live eternally with Him or without Him, depending on the choices we make, the moments that we have on this earth. But it's more than just that eternal part of us. Second, there is in the image and likeness of God, we reflect certain attributes of the Creator. Each one of us are endowed with personality traits that have a, a reflection or an identity of what God's character is like. Now, I'm not saying that you're like God or that someday you will be God. I don't want to be confusing here. But there are in the moments that we get things right, there are in each of us a reflection of what God's image is, what he has made us to be. And lastly, God has created us, male and female. This passage introduces God's design for humanity in a binary way. And as much as I don't want to spend time talking about this, with the amount of questions that I'm fielding in the office, I have to set aside some time to address this. You are created male and female. There are two categories. It's an either-or situation. It's not two polar opposites with a slide scale in between that you get to pick and choose where you want to sit. They are separate and distinct. If you are a female, you are born with XX chromosomes. And if you are a male, you're born XY chromosomes. And God created the sexes for a purpose. It is necessary for the process of procreation. It is also... Uh, male and female, that they may come together as a, uh, a helper for one another. Jesus reinforces this teaching in the New Testament. He says, have you not heard that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? 
Now, the world today tells us that we need to be more tolerant and more accepting of the transgender community. And I cannot argue or disagree with that. If a person is experiencing gender dysphoria, they are welcome here. And they are loved. If for no other reason that they are an image and likeness of the God who created them. And he, they are every bit as much of a beloved creation whose God's breath was breathed into in an intimate fashion as they were formed. And so we love them. The question comes down to what is that definition of love? And in my position, it is to speak the truth in love. What is the truth? In our world, that's totally subjective. Each person has the right to select what truth is to them. Arbitrary truth instead of objective truth. But I would say that that's not love. I got, a, again, a family member who's checked into a drug, drug rehab, just finishing up 45 days. <laughs> this is his first go around. Okay. To him, love would be, let me get my fix on. Let me continue in the patterns of self-destruction because I don't like being in this position. Now, thankfully, he's had enough godly influence in his life to bring him around to a point where he understands that if I continue down this road, it's destructive. Loving him is not giving him another fix. It is doing the hard thing and speaking truth into him that you need to get off this train and you need to step into what God has created you for. So again, if someone is transgender and they wish to worship with us, they are more than welcome here. We do have just a few ground rules, just for clarification. If you're a biological man, use the biological man bathroom. If you're biologically female, use the female bathroom. If that is uncomfortable for you for any reason, there are bathrooms up in the front hallway that you're more than welcome to use. And that's just, that's just the ground rules uh, as, as we're here so that everybody is, is clear about that. I don't want to differentiate between just this idea of transgender because all of us suffer some sort of identity crisis. If you want to find a group of sinners, all you got to do is show up on Sunday to any church. And there we are. Each of us trying to figure out what it is that God has called us to do. What it is that we are created for. Why am I here? Why do I exist? For what purpose has God put me on this earth? Why, why do I have an, an, an opportunity or an obligation to fulfill things? And so that's what I want to look at today. I want to just spend some time in this idea that you're created. That you're created in the image and the likeness of God you're created male and female, but more than all of that, you are created for a purpose. And one of the reasons that, that the world is so hip to the, the blur, the distinction in, in, in gender identity is because it can undermine all of God's revelation in his scripture. The entire book of Hosea has to be thrown out if we lose sight of what it means, that uh, the metaphorical example of God's love as a faithful committed husband who continually redeems his unfaithful wife that is that is one book all of scripture exists that for God to reveal himself to us and so if we can blur all those lines we can undermine the book of Hosea where we don't need to or can't understand it and we completely lose an accurate understanding of Christ as the bridegroom who is sacrificing his life for his bride the church Chaz Bono put it this way about gender confusion. There's a gender in your brain and a gender in your body. For 99% of the people, those things are in alignment. For trans transgender people, they're mismatched. That's all it is. It's not complicated. It's not a neurosis. It's a mix-up. It's a birth defect, just like a cleft palate. Well, I don't agree with that assessment of the problem. The two don't align. So how do I find peace? How do I become in a place where I can be okay with that? 
Well, I either have to change my mind or I have to change my gender. That's the only way I can make it work. If the two are at odds, something's got to match up. And the world tells us it's impossible to change my mind, so I have to fix my gender. But I want to tell you what Paul says. Instead of buying into society's lie that it has to be that way, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, he says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I don't care what you're wrestling with today. When your thoughts are separate from God's truths, and when you are trying to make the way you want things to be aligned with how you feel about them, we need to remember that it needs to be brought into line with God's wisdom through Christ. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Living sacrifice. Serving and working, not to self, but to what God's plan is for your, design, that for your life. This is our spiritual act of worship, he says. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The truth is that God has created us. We're not here by accident. We are created in his image that we might reflect who he is. And we are created for a purpose. Each one of you created for a reason, for a mission to fill. In Jeremiah 1.5, the word of the Lord says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God created each one of us for a specific purpose. The trick is figuring out what that is. For Jeremiah, it was pretty easy because God told him. This is why I set you apart from before you were born. This is why I knew you to be a prophet to the nations. Now, I don't know about you. I've never received that direct word that for this reason, Jody, you were created. Any of you got that word? All of us are wondering, who am I? Why am I here? For what purpose has God created me? And the question is, am I willing to surrender my desires that I might be what God has created me to be? And so while we may not get to decide what our purpose is in life, we do get to decide whether we'll live into it or not. You can decide whether you will fulfill God's purpose for your life. And I promise you that in and doing God's will in your life, you will find a joy and a peace and a fulfillment that you will never find trying to get your answers from the world. When we live our life in accordance with who God created us to be, that is the abundant life. That is the peace and the joy and the satisfaction that is promised to us. So we need to understand that we're created by God. We need to understand that we're created for a purpose. And our goal today is to, to just kind of get our head around the idea of how do we discern what that purpose is. One of the ways that we can figure out what it is that God has made us to do is in discerning the areas of our giftedness. You're gifted. You're gifted with certain innate abilities. Some of you are just athletic. It's the way it is. Some of you, not so much. I was one of these guys that, while I had phenomenal strength all through my athletic career, there are two things I was never able to do. Use that strength and explosive power to run fast or jump high. And my coaches would just be blown away by how is it that you can constantly test as one of the strongest sets of legs on the team and I can measure your vertical leap with a handful of papers slid underneath. 
I just couldn't do it because, because we have natural abilities. Some things are just natural. I got a lot of twins in our family. And I have uh, one set of twins. They'll be 18 this year. Uh, one of them is 5 foot 10. The male. The female is 4 foot 10. Born at the same time, same gene pool, same social, economic, and nurturing background. It's just the way they are. One is a foot taller than the other. One of them is extremely adept at mathematics and science. Just thinks mathematically. You know people like that? The other one, not so much. But literary? <laughs> Genius. This kid can write some stories that blow your mind away. The characters in her story actually live in her mind. They're real things. They're just the, the vivid imagination that the one has and the other has no idea what they're talking about. They lost me again. I have another set of twins. Uh, they're a little bit younger, and they're hilarious to watch. While one of them can literally, with hands and feet, just run up a tree, the other one can't do a pull-up to save his life. But he can, at eight years old, watch you working on something and mechanically have it figured out, oftentimes before you. Just constantly inquisitive about what it is, what, why we're doing that, what, what, what makes that work, and be able to just put that together. You know, people like that, right? Again, same gene pool, same background, same everything, yet totally different in what their natural gifted ability is. And each one of you have those natural abilities. So when you're trying to discern why has God made me, for what purpose do I exist, where can I bring glory to God in my daily living, it's easy to look at what our natural talents are to help discern that. What am I good at? What do I stink at? Now, oftentimes in the church, what winds up happening is that we have a ministry that is like a really good ministry, and somebody should do something about that. And so somebody's like, well, I want this to thrive even though I'm no good at it. So they get in the mix of it and start working at it. But if you're not gifted or have the ability to do that, I don't care how important it is that a good meal gets served. Your pies stink maybe. I don't know. Serve in our strengths. Figure out what it is that we can do that, that we're adept at. Now, in addition to that, as believers, we are empowered with the Holy Spirit of God who endows us with certain spiritual gifts as well. And that brings us to a, a point of strength that enables us to achieve and accomplish other things. These spiritual gifts are everything from administration to, to being an apostle, somebody who is sent out to share the good news, to discernment, being able to, to look at things and understand you know, what, what, the, what the objective truth is in something instead of being misled or led astray by, by the arbitrariness of the world today. Some are gifted with the spiritual gift of evangelism. They just have an ability to share that simple message of good news that God loves you. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. That's how God showed his love to you. And some people are just great at it. We know some in this church that are just, they have no problem standing at the gas station, pumping gas. God loves you to the person pumping gas next to him. Very good at it. And that's a spiritual gift. And if you're good at it, you're probably gifted in evangelism and you should get off the church appearance team and get on the evangelism team so that you can help share the good news with other people. Some are good at exhortation, to encourage people, to come alongside somebody and just give them a, a word of encouragement, to exhort them to, to step into what they're created for. All of us are given a certain measure of faith that we can believe in what that God has done for us individually and that we come to know Christ in a personal way. Some people are spiritually gifted in, in giving. They're just generous people. And they're not often the, the most wealthiest people, although sometimes they are. And some people that have too much have been given are just very generous with it. And we know those people. And some people are, are the most generous people in the world, and, and they don't have much at all. And when I think of those people, I think of the story where Jesus is sitting 
at the temple across from the collection box, and he's watching the offering that is given. And the widow comes in, and she just puts in two little coins, two half pennies, if you will. And he tells his disciples, she has given the greatest gift ever. Generosity is a spiritual gift, uh, uh, the, the gift of being able to give monetarily, give of self, give of your time. Some people have a gift of helps. They're just there. They're just always there with, with a hand for you in a time of need. Some knowledge, some leadership, some prophecy, serving others. Some have a gift of wisdom. You are created and you are gifted naturally and spiritually to fulfill what that purpose is. And it's important that we understand what our purpose is so that we can become who God has made us to be. Now, it's very popular to say, I don't like the way I was created. I don't care for the things in my life, the parameters that are set around me. And there are certain things that you can change and things that you cannot change. I don't care how strong I get, I'm never going to jump high. It's just not going to happen. Now, I can grumble and complain about that all I want. But the point is, not jumping. Period. Live with it. In Romans 9, Paul says, But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use. The context of this, in other words, is that we don't get to pick what our natural giftedness is. We don't get to pick what spiritual gifts we get. That's in God's hands. The potter always tells the clay what to become. The clay never tells the potter what I'm going to be. Well, why does it matter? Because <laughs> God created you for a purpose, to do something in his kingdom, to bring glory to him and fulfillment to you. And the potter gets to use the clay to make an ornate, beautiful, decorative piece worthy of hanging in a palace or a soap dish. And whichever of those things you are created to be, the encouragement for you is to be the best soap dish or decorative piece you can possibly be. And as I told my daughter all through her life growing up, sometimes you don't have to like it, you just have to live with it. And what God has created you to do, figure it out and live into that. And that is fulfilling purpose. Not just fulfilling your purpose, but being fulfilled in the purpose that you are created for. God uses the clay to make what he wants to make so that it can bring glory to him. And we have numerous opportunities to serve. And so one of the things we're doing today is we're just highlighting what some of these ministries we are that we have within the church and in the local community. And so as we break today, once we're done with, with our final worship song and, and we gather for a little time of fellowship, uh, take time as you work around the building here just looking at what these different ministries are. For many, there are new faces in here today and we, we want to encourage you, get on board. Get in the game. Become what God has created you to be, that you can step in and fill a gap in somebody's life. We heard Lori and, and Marie from Love, Inc. stand up here and, and tell us some of the, the ways that they were able to fill in the gaps in people's lives. And each and every one of us have an opportunity to do that. And so I would encourage you to find out what it is that God has created you for. Spend some time looking at some of the ministries that we have this afternoon uh, as, as we break from here. And, and just... Sign up for something. And if you can't find uh, something out here that fits you, there's a clipboard out there somewhere that's just a general sign-up sheet. If you want to just put your name down for, hey, someday call me when something needs to be done. This Saturday we're having a work be here at, at the building. We're going to be doing some spring cleanup at the parsonage and, and around the building here. Um, you can contact AJ or Sam about that. Um, you can get on the list for that to be called when work bees come up. You can get on that, that on-call list for when emergencies come up. Somebody's house is burned out because of fire or something, and, and we just need someone to call in, in, in that hot moment to take care of an emergency need.
And so that would be that sign-up sheet. You know, so everybody has a role to play in the kingdom of God. And too many people are fulfilling the role of what not to be and how not to be, that those positions are full. Now we need the active participants to get in the game with what they are gifted to do spiritually and physically for God's kingdom. And so this is what I, I would encourage you to do. Take, take time to look at, at what's going on in our local ministries with Love, Inc. and Lydia's Gate and His Love Family Resources and the 10 ministry teams that we have within the church here. And just know this. The, the last word of encouragement I have for you is that you are not a mistake and you are not an accident. You are an on purpose. God has knit you together. He knew you before you were born. He breathed his breath into you, and he desires nothing more than a loving relationship with you and that you come to know intimately the God who loves you. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we do come before you again today just thankful for your love for us. And though we say it over and over and over again, Lord, it is, it is a true expression of how much you care for us that draws us into that desire for that relationship with you, Lord. Make us know who you are and make us know who we are created by you and for what purpose that we might bring your kingdom to this earth. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.